Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening, everybody. This is Guru Tom Tanya, and welcome to FMA Discussion Episode 265. And tonight, we have Guru Audrey Carbonell. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> An intro, eh? And of course, it, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to be co-hosted by none other than <laughs> Guru. <laughs> right. So, good evening, everyone. And with me, <laughs> welcome to FMA Discussion Episode uh, 265. So tonight, we've got Audrey Carbonell as our guest. And of course, uh, for all of you, uh, everybody knows that Audrey is already one of our moderators. Okay, so good evening. Uh, no, good afternoon still, guys. In your, on your end. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah. So if you're watching this uh, episode, please uh, don't forget to say hi and tell us where you're watching from. And if you have any questions for Audrey, please don't hesitate to um, put it in the comment box. Okay. Oh, your mask is gone now, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> this Brian's. I love, I love that mask, Brian. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. I, I have that fear. Like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're, just, we're just having some fun now. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So we've got uh, two. Oh, by the way, guys, if, you, if ever you miss this episode, always we're, uh, this episode will come out in uh, the FMA discussion YouTube channel so if you haven't uh, subscribed to it yet please do okay and remember the more you subscribe the more you watch the more uh things get into um monetary uh sponsorships and everything they all go to charity again we're going we're going we're going, we're going to say this again nothing goes to us Okay, we all do these interviews. We all do we all do this for you for the FMA community, out of our love for FMA. Okay, we all give them to charity. Nobody's buying beach houses here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's buying Range Rovers, Land Rovers, and shit. In there. No, no, we just got the love. love. Sorry, you can leave now if you want to. Sorry, cats have the bag. No, don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Good evening, uh, Frank. Hello, he says uh, from Connecticut. Uh, hi, Brett. Hi, Glenn. Yeah, man, I missed you when I was in uh, in California. Next time, next time. Right, uh, Lawrence Eugenio and Alvin. Good evening, guys. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Let's start the ball rolling. Um, Audrey, how did you start your martial arts journey before, even before FMA? So, um... okay. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, so technically I started when I was six, but I actually had a taste of it because I had to personally defend myself at a really young age. So I was actually born in Philippines and I took, I did my first set of, of schoolwork <laughs> Right, Quezon City. Um, so I, I was in a private school, and um, I was, I think, I was four or five. And you know, back in the day, you know, you have a yaya, a nanny, right? My yaya was uh, from Mindanao, and she was like, she was a really spiritual. You know, did the, you know, she believed in oration, and she believed in, you know, she was the daughter of witch doctor. So the story goes that you know, she one day said to my mom, she's like, oh, uh, mom, you know. I think uh, I have this uh, little little vitamin for your daughter. You know, it'll it'll spark up her her soul. You know, she'll she'll put passion and fire in her soul. So my mom's like, oh, okay, sure. You know, so I don't exactly know what I took, but three days later, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just I just gave something to me and I took it. Tropical right? acid. Bro. <laughs> 
<laughs> Brian, we need those. <laughs> Oh, I got to. <laughs> it's, funny, it's a running joke in my family, right? So, you know, three days later, three days later, I'm in class, right? And the teacher walks out with the kid because the kid had to go to the bathroom. So the teacher was like, you know, the teacher was gone. So of course, when the teacher's gone, like all the kids are like, oh, you know, kid teacher's gone. We're gonna like, we're gonna have, we're gonna get in trouble. Well, this big kid, like about two two sizes above me, right? They're, he's a huge kid. I mean, I swear to God, I feel like he was gliding and I was like little David, right? He like t- picks me up by the by the shirt and he throws me in the closet. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, right? And at one point I had this like weird idea. I was like, okay, what if I play dead? So I'm like here, like, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. Like, waiting. And then the kid, I guess, was like, okay, what's going on? Why is she, she struggling, right? So she opened the door and then boom, like I smack him in the nose and all this blood comes out. And I guess I broke his <laughs> nose. <laughs> and I got suspended. <laughs> I got suspended at four. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and my mom was my mom looked at my yaya and she was like, Did you give her? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's so like that yeah. was kind of like yeah, that so that was kind of like my intro to self defense. So okay. fast forward to six years old, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, is the that? intro intro to martial arts or intro to dropping acid or was that some PCP <laughs> or something? <laughs> it was an intro to self defense because I had to. Oh. Like, so fast forward to six years old, you know. I I love boxing, but my mom was like. Anak, what are you doing? You're a girl, you know? You don't do that. You, you do you do Barbie dolls. You know, I'm here like with the freaking Ninja Turtles. You know, I want a freaking, I want a box. So at one point, my uncle kind of felt bad. So, you know, he bought me a punching bag. Um, but he said it was his, but it was mine. So what happened was, um, what happened was, uh, so he bought me a punching bag and he started teaching me. But it was kind of in secret because my mom didn't want me to do martial arts. And, you know, I started I started doing basic boxing, you know, uh, jab hook, you know, jab cross hook hook. Um, and I started working on my footwork. I was six. So every day I passed by a martial arts school, um, uh, karate kung fu. And after five years of every day asking my mom, mom, can I go? Mom, can I go? Mom, can I go? Uh, finally, you know, she finally took me to school. Right. And immediately, you know, I was thrown in sparring. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm sparring kids bigger than me and you know grown-ups bigger than me and um you know that's kind of where it started um was martial arts uh, it was karate kung fu for united uh united mm-hmm. health students it was, was what it called mm-hmm. um so i did that for three months um but unexpectedly it got shut down so you know one day i walked in, I, I i went to my my usual sparring class and it was all dark and i was like what the heck you know so you know, I and after that, my mom's like, okay, well, you know what? You will look for another school. And then I was like, okay, mom, blah, 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 blah. 11 years, 11 years. And then I, I get into Shotokan. Shotokan was, um, I felt like, you know, it was, it was okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't fluid. To me, it was a little, a little hard, too hard mm-hmm. for me. So, you know, I, and then my mom's like, well, you know, if, if you don't like it, then, you know, it's not, it's, you, you, you need to take a break. So I said, okay, fine, you know. So, uh, fast forward to high school, you know, and I was already itching for martial arts. Like I was, I was wanting to go back, but my mom, you know, being, I'm a girl, um, you know, it took a while. So what I did was in order for me to maintain my sparring, I started a fight club in the back of the gym. So, <laughs> so I was, I was sparring, um, high schoolers twice my size because I wanted to fight. I wanted to learn how to fight, but at the same time, I didn't want to lose what little skills I learned. So mm-hmm. I, I started a fight club and um, I got <laughs> caught. I almost got suspended again. So, you know, Bobby <laughs> Durden. Eventually, eventually Ty- my mom's like, Tyler Durden. <laughs> I was like, Aubrey Durden. <laughs> fight club during the time fight club was a thing okay but you know um. and it was so funny because you know i was fighting guys and it was like you know i'm like fighting i'm ready right and then the guys just like looking at me and i'm like yo kevin dude like 
let's let's fight and he's like oh he's like oh, are we gonna go to movies and i'm like no kevin this is not like a date thing okay i'm not i'm not trying to like i'm not trying to, you know, I'm trying to fight and he just won't like he just wouldn't hit me right so i was like oh my god dude kevin man okay no no i'm not going on a date with you we're just gonna we're just gonna train so anyways i i got caught and during high school um i was the smallest i was i'm five one so everybody else was taller so you know i got i got bullied by guys in fact i got slapped by a guy and i threw him down into a body slam and i ground and pound Damn. well before I bjj um and i was watching wwe so i was mimicking some moves when we were young <laughs> <laughs> hey, were you doing? Were you doing the Booker T one? You know the Booker T. No, the no, 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 no. Yeah. I did this, this, the, the body slam because the guy like ran up to me. Flexing. And, yeah. Yeah. So yeah the, the body slam going around and over because I used his momentum. The reason why I did that was because he slapped me, and my hands get very fast. So I, I jabbed him. I like I, I did a backhand very, very quickly, and he didn't realize that. So. He ran and he ran towards me. He went into a sparring move. So what I did, you know, I'm five one. This guy's like five seven. I was like, boom, you know, and I did a ground and pound. And I had to get ripped off by the by half the class because like, and then they had to separate us. And I then I almost got suspended again. Um, another, Damn. And then another time, another time, another way of me using it was a guy like came up to me thinking that I was okay with. A guy grabbing my my body part, so I took his wrist and I tweaked it and I and I threw him down and then I once again I almost got ripped off again because I was about to break his wrist. So you know, eventually my mom's like, "Okay, you know, maybe you're a girl, but maybe you maybe maybe God made a mistake. Maybe you were supposed to be a guy." You know, <laughs> and I have, I have, you know that maybe something something went wrong. You know, that's, there's something. You know, you're maybe you're just a dude. So I was like, you're, you're a dude in a girl's body. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably, We're not going right? to go there. We're not going to go there. Political, political, right? <laughs> so I mean, I was like, okay, okay, you know what? Let's, let's, you know, let's, let's roll with this, right? My mom's finally like, okay, you know what? I can't stop you. You know, I, I, I give you these diamond earrings and you lose these diamond earrings when you're playing tactical paintball. And I was like, well, mom, you know, the, the deer that was walking around the tactical paintball, he's probably wearing my bling. I'm sure it looks better at him, on him than on me, right? So I was like, you know, it's all good. It's all good. I contributed to nature, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> anyway, so fast forward, fast forward. And, um, you know, I, I bump into certain little groups. You know, I did, I tried to do a little bit of Kuxul Wan. Um, I did capoeira. Uh, I did six months, eight months of capoeira which in, in San Francisco State. Um, I did um, a little bit of uh, Shorin Ryu. Now, Shorin Ryu like, is kind of like Sh uh, Shotokan, but in the Okinawan region. Yeah. Now, yeah. on the start, like, unfortunately, like, there are so many. Um, there, unfortunately, with, with my history, there is a point where it does get dark. And this is kind of one of them. So I was in Shorin Ryu um, for about, I'd like to say three to four months. And I was the only woman there. And the teacher, um, seeing as how I was like, really trying to learn as much as I can, um, he put me through this express, so it was expressed black belt, you know, mm -hmm. where I learn a technique, I learn a technique and I teach it. So, you know, I was like an assistant instructor. And the reason why he felt that I had to be an assistant instructor first was because to be a teacher, to break it down to the children, it would be, you know, it would be you learning in the process. You learn yeah. how to teach for your yeah. student. So anyways, um, and in the middle of that training, I, you know, I was the only woman and I, I there was like six of us and um, there was, it was in a school of 50. I think it was like 50, something like that. And um, in in the evenings, you know, we practiced stance. We had forward stance, back stance. Um, and if we did it wrong, we had this kendo stick and we got smacked in the back. We got smacked really yeah. hard, okay. right? And um, I'm a woman, you know, I had to spar these guys. 
And these guys were like 5'7", 5'8", 5'11", 6'1". So I had to spar them. And there was a, a point where I sparred a guy and the teacher was like, don't, don't, over, don't um, expose your, your sides. I didn't listen. So when I sparred, he told, the, he told the guy, he was like, if she raises her arm again, I want you to sidekick her and break her in. So I did happen. Some Cobra Kai uh, type shit there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Was that Terry Silver or what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was intense. I, I raised up and boom, like I could not breathe. And I literally had a footprint like on my side for Dang. a good week and a half could not breathe um and you know i had and but you know that was the training that was the training i had to get back up and i had to train and you know if i did something wrong like the two guys would like rip my my legs apart to try to get me to do splits and like it you know to you know it was like really painful so that was kind of like my training um but at one point you know and unfortunately like this is kind of like some this is the kind of the the hiccup with being a woman in the martial arts um the guy the instructor came on to me and in fact like he kind of cornered me and it gave me the heebie-jeebies so i had to stop so you know i and it's a good thing that my ex at the time walked in on us because i mm -hmm. like i felt unsafe and this guy was like coming on to me really strong and i was just like oh my god you know who's gonna rescue me right good thing my my ex-boyfriend at the time he walked in well you yeah. know i quit I quit. I, like, I could not go back. You know? And months later, the guy got arrested for pedophilia. Oh. So, yeah. Chester. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, it, it was like, it was a blow to us, us assistant instructors, because we were like, oh my God, you know, that was our students, you know? Mm. So it took a while for me to get back into a formal martial arts because of what had happened. Because I felt at the time that I kind of let my kids go. You know, I, I, I left them. You know, I didn't protect them. So, you know, and as an instructor, as an assistant instructor, I always have a moral obligation to take care of my kids, take care of my students, right? So anyways, it took a while. And eventually, like, I did go back. I ended up doing Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And... Okay. Um, at FTCC in um, in Daly City, and I did uh, Serata Escrima. Uh, so I did Serata Escrima under um, under uh, Bob Manalo, uh, who was under at the time under Grandmaster Sultan Udin. And at the same time, so I was I was training five to six days a week. I was mm -hmm. training also Cook Sol Juan. So you know, I I did a lot of you know. And, you know, uh, for in the beginning of uh, my my Scream of Serata, um, I was training a lot of um, angle one, counter one. And I'm, okay. and the reason why I say this is it's going to come back to me. It's going to end, end, end up haunting me and saving me. And, and this is where I'm going to end up telling the story. So I was, I was an immature martial artist. I did not take into account the importance of technique and why we do things over and over and over and over again. So I, what I did was, um, you know, I was, I, I kind of slacked off. I kind of slacked off. I was like, why do I have to keep doing angle one, counter one? You know, what, I mean, what, you know, it's, it's, I keep doing it. Right. Well, I, I ended up joining the army and in the army, um, I did army combatives. I did army combatives and I did what we call pugils. Pugils is, um, fighting with your rifle and yeah. you are, you know, using it almost like a, a bow. Yeah. So. You know, my my uh, first encounter was um, with uh, harassment. Was um, I was on fire duty, and I and the guy asked me to go train with him to do army combatives, and I was I was on guard. And the first general order in the army is you never leave your post. Well, thank God I did it because the guy ended up getting in trouble for sexual harassment with two other people that you know they were supposedly training. So that was like the first thing in the army, right? Fast forward to, you know, I did combat medic school. I was in San Antonio and, you know, I, and uh, they voluntold me to sign up for a army combatives tournament. So army combatives tournament was a, um, a combative tournament for all of Fort Sam Houston. And it was all of the students. And I did not want to go. Like, I just wanted to study my combat medic, you know, try to pass, you know, do my PT and be done with it. Right? <laughs> yeah. 
flies low, flies low, low key, low radar, right? But my friend was like, Aubrey, or sorry, Carbonell, you know, I, I signed you up for the, the tournament. And I was like, what? We're women, let's represent. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so unfortunately, um, 50 people signed up. 50 people signed up. Uh, and it was a gauntlet. It was a gauntlet. Um, All right. Was, okay. It started at four o'clock in the morning. And from four o'clock in the morning uh, to six o'clock, we were rolling. And whoever whoever lost got kicked off the team. And I had to take out four people out of those people. And I was the only woman in the 16 team, 16 man team. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was pretty intense, man. <laughs> so, you know, fast forward to the tournament, you know, I, I, was, I was fighting this girl. I was fighting this girl. And I, I'm pretty stubborn. Um, I didn't tap. I, I didn't want to lose and I messed up my shoulder, but I still kept fighting. And at one point I had this girl in submission and a lot of patience. Oh, oh, you're off. Damn, this is getting good too. No. <laughs> we should have to come back in again. Yeah, sorry guys, but all right. Well, <clears throat> that's quite, that was quite a story. <laughs> what what OJ is saying. Yeah, it sounds like she got abused a lot early in part of the training. I was like, damn. Yeah. Breaking ribs and shit. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've had like some, when I trained with two on Ruby, like some rough training like that. But like, I didn't, she didn't say for like, you know, go break somebody's shoulder, go break somebody's wrist. So it was just, you know, but I guess every system's different. Every people teach different. Yeah. Oh, what, what, one thing I, I wanted to touch on, uh, it's kind of a touchy, sensitive subject. Is uh, you notice most of the time uh, there's a lot of uh, pedophilia that goes on in martial arts schools. Um, um, and I've seen, and, and the reason I've said that is because just the last week I've been when I I always check the you know I go to the news all the time and my my Facebook and then like you know online things. There's a lot of instructors getting arrested for child abuse, sexual abuse. And uh, it's yeah. when she told me about that guy getting arrested for pedophilia, it's, it's not like uncommon in the it's industry not, mm. to see that. Mm. So it's kind of very disturbing. Um, yeah. I know I, I've, I've I had a, a person recently that wanted me to teach their, their child, and then they were like, Oh, I need to do a background yeah. on you. And they're very cautious of bringing them, yeah, of course, the training. Yeah, uh, actually, <clears throat> here in the UK, there are a lot of cases as well. Uh, name it, especially football. Yeah. So you've got all the coaches actually being uh, being uh, uh, arrested, and yeah, uh, yeah. it's very coaches. disturbing. It's very disturbing. Yes. That's why here, like in, in the UK, you need to have a an extended um, police check. Yeah. So yeah, and as part of our um, part of our protection for ourselves, we don't actually train, especially with kids. On their own, we always have to be in the open. Groups, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It has to be in the groups. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's right, back. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay. Shall we put so, shall we put Audrey in the middle again? <laughs> so, okay. There you go. Hold on. There you go. Okay. okay. All right. So where was I? Oh yeah, I was at the tournament. 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 So I was at the tournament and I had the chance to be able to break somebody's. Thank you guys. <laughs> I had a chance to break this person's wrist, right? And this is a service <laughs> from um, Damn. like aiming for arms, right? So, you know, I had a chance to break this person's wrist. And the instructor was like, break her shoulder, break her shoulder, break her shoulder. And this girl was was screaming, man. And I was like, I look at myself and I, I, I look into myself and this is like all in the course of five seconds, right? I look into myself and I'm like, you know what? This is my service member. This is my battle buddy. This person, if I go to war, is going to hopefully save my life. Mm, yeah. Why do I want to, why would I want to break this person? Yeah, exactly. Send this person home. Mm, yep. That's true. I let go and I took the loss because I couldn't do it. I could not, I could not do it. Mm. And and I was like, you know what, you know, because some things are just more important than the win. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. So 
Yeah. So, you know, I got I got stationed in in Fort Myer, Fort Myer, Virginia. And the Fort Myer, Virginia is the old guard. Now, the old guard's mission is to one, escort the president two protect the military district of Washington and three um, provide uh, health care for foreign dignitaries, the president, mm -hmm. the Joint Chief of Staff. And we do missions for the mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Anyway, so very prestigious. You know, this, it's a small base. Um, unfortunately, though, um, during that time, uh, because uh, th this was well before the YouTube movement or the YouTube movement with Vanessa Gillen. Now, I personally had that experience where one time a sergeant that was supposed to be taking me home decided to not take the turn and decided to take me to his house. And I was like, you know, I'm like talking to him and I was like, oh, sergeant, there's my uh, friend's house right there. You're supposed to drop me off. And he was like, oh, no, we're not going home. We're not going to that house. And I was like, huh? And he was like, I'm taking you to my house. And I, then and there, like, I was like, oh, shh. okay. We're, I'm looking at web. I'm looking around, looking around. I was like, am I going to jump out of this car? Am I going to, am I going to have to duck and roll? Am I going to have to do this, do that? So anyways, um, thank God my battle buddy calls me. He's like, Aubrey, where are you? And I was like, oh, um, Sergeant's taking me to your house. And he was like, all right, let me make a U-turn. I'm going to go drop you off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was close. That was so, close. close. So, so you've actually, uh, you've actually, uh, you've actually used a lot of this stuff. And that's why I like to emphasize it. You've actually used a lot of this stuff and not just training, but you've actually real life situations. Hmm. You see the value in the training and you, and you've actually utilized that training to get yourself out of some like sticky situations, which is, I think I want people to see that, you know, and emphasize that, that you've, that you've done that. Not just yes. all like talk, you know, I've trained, but you've actually used it. Hmm. Yes, I ha I've had to, I've had to. Now, yeah. the, re the reason why I said, I had to overtrain, train and overtrain angle one, counter one of Serata. So I got into a, a, an altercation where I was, I was inebriated. I was drinking, right? And it was in with somebody that I knew. <laughs> right? So anyways, unfortunately, you know, that's what it is. But unfortunately, what had happened was, you know, I, I was a little, you know, tipsy, right? the guy ended up thinking that I was any normal, you know, female that did not know how to defend herself. He, de he decided to try to assault me. The angle one counter one, even if I was drunk, was mm. the one that it was out embedded of there. Yeah. I did the angle one counter one was able to run away and get help. Mm. And so, you know, Serata actually saved my life. Because that would have been a very, very bad thing. I would not be here if it wasn't mm -hmm. for me doing angle one, mm -hmm. angle one, counter one of Serata for days on end. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my experience in the army. You know, everything else was great, you know. And uh, honestly, like, I would do it again. In a heartbeat, I would do it again. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I got out of the army, went into San Diego. And from San Diego, I trained, you know, BJ, BJJ. Muay Thai. And um, I'll never forget it. Um, it was foundations class. And I met up with um, PG Romeo de los Reyes. Um, and so he, it, he, it turns out that he taught Babao Arniz Kakoy, Kakoy dos Pares. Uh, so I joined his class and, you know, and I loved it and it was, everything was great. Now, unfortunately though, I was in a very, very bad, I wouldn't say very bad relationship, but I was in something of a domestic situation um where i've had to get away when somebody had their hands on me but someone that i was very very close mm -hmm. to um and i've had to use it in fact i've had a knife pointed at me and i said you know what if you go, you know and he was like you know are you scared and i was like <laughs> no if if you use me so much as move i'm gonna take that same knife i'm gonna stab you in the stomach and i'm gonna lay you up to your throat and sure enough he backed off <laughs> damn <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get pretty intense. <laughs> so you know, bad situation happened, and I had to take my kids out of my bad situation, and I got re and I was relocated to Las Vegas. Um, and you know, at PG Romeo was really, really kind enough to tell me that there was an instructor here in Las Vegas. Um, so he got me connected with Sifu Justin Cataldi, um, where he taught me. Um, 
a blend of Inosanto, a blend of Lukai Lukai, a blend of um, a little bit of Illustrissimo, um, a little bit of uh, Lima Lama Lua, a little bit of Tai Chi, Tai Chi Kwan. It was, it was a blend um, and a little bit of concepts of Jeet Kune Do. So okay. I was with him for about a year, year and a half, but you know, things happen. Um, that's not out of our control. And um, I found my way into Kulahan Mandaregma under uh, Grandmaster Mark Behick. Uh, I did that in, ter uh, I did that, uh, in terms of, of the training for about a year, year and a half. Um, but you know, things happen, you know, things, you know, things happen where, you know, if you guys don't see eye to eye, you know, and unfortunately things happen um, where I separated myself from Pulahan Mandaregma. Now, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of the things where I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say anything bad about anybody in the community, community. Um, everybody's great, you know, but sometimes when you, when the separation isn't a, a mutual situation, um, mm -hmm. things are said, you know, and unfortunately I, you know, I was in, it, there were a lot of people that were, you know, saying bad things about me in the community. Um, you'll never pick up your sticks again. Nobody will train you. Nobody will want you. So I reached out to one grandmaster and he was, you know, I said, you know, am I ostracized? Um, who's going to take me? Who's going to help me train? And that person was like, Aubrey, train alone. Nobody's going to no, train, train alone. And I was like, wow, I'm going to get left in the dust like this, right? So FMA leper. I, <laughs> right and that's what I felt like I was like you know what like how can how can this happen you know so mm -hmm. I'm going through FMA discussions you know I'm looking through FMA discussions you know trying to pick up what I can from everybody who um everybody who is um sending stuff and I'm trying to train from everybody right and I see two Jack Latours post the global Kronza project right so I'm like you know what I'm gonna I'm, you know, I'm going to comment, you know, I said, you know, it's a, it's a great project. It's a great thought, you know, thought provoking process of, of getting everybody together. You know, so Tuan Jack, you know, personally invited me to do a, the Global Kronza project. And, you know, and from there I met, you know, people that were very influential to me. Um, in fact, somebody, you know, in the Global Kronza project um, from way back when um, told me, hey, Aubrey, you know, your stuff is good. Post it. And I was like, Post it, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, uh, so he was like, he was like, nah, I'll repost it, post that. No, no woman has ever done it. And so I said, uh, okay, post, right? And next thing you know, like the freaking double crumb, the crumbit, double crumbit, single bust done. I was like, like just totally went off, and I was like. Wow, you know, <laughs> and so you know, like after after doing that, you know, after doing all of that, it was, you know, it was an eye opening experience because it. I felt that you know I'm in a community where um, I belong. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very positive light. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's very, very, very nice, very supportive, and you know, this comes to where you know where we are now, where you know I I'm here now you know enjoying enjoying everybody's company and every what everybody puts into the martial art mm. so it's you know, it's been a journey it's been a crazy intense like 13 plus something here. it is intense the journey is intense <laughs> but man. yeah <laughs> uh, okay uh we'll we'll just uh say hi to some people and then read some of their comments um okay so yeah dean says hi and sorry forgot to clear the <laughs> I've, I've done it um, the ball. i know the ball. lawrence lawrence eugenio okay said hi um jan copes from massachusetts Hayes ramirez from new jersey Tuhan bobby said kamusta sis uh sean uh says hello from toronto um to on bobby yeah to on bobby again uh, saying hi to me <laughs> right then brett Ree said I, re I realized my daughter is quite lucky although she does not know yet maybe something so uh, maybe Myra Hinson, yeah to on bobby student from st louis she like, likes the podcast thank you very much thank you very much um uh brett wants to know if they can clone you i told him uh fma discussion has a, a rights to her dna so. 
Yeah. Sorry, Brad. Sorry. 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 <laughs> if if that's gonna happen, it's for it's for our purposes. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, Glenn said you should do a collaboration with Jokoy and make a video. <laughs> Thank you. All my material is original. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Be a stand up comedian. <laughs> right. Um, so, Brett said too many, too many bad guys out there. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Richard says hello from San Diego. Oh, uh, Raymond Floro from Australia. And Brett said, I can only assume you you became faster and learned how to equal power through motion. Equal the power through motion. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A little bit faster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Glenn Gutierrez uh, says uh, he was in the San Francisco State 2000s. He might have ran into you. Ooh. <laughs> um, no, Glenn, my, my son, well, yeah, he yeah, he could like my question. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sure he could play anything, so I'm sure that could, we could make that happen sometime during one of the episodes. That's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lord, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, a good question Brett has is, uh, wants to know, what knuckles do the three of you choose to strike with as you each apply daily? To me, that's important. So, okay, in terms of, yeah, so usually I strike with the, the, the first two, um, just for the bigger. Um, and, I do uh, for three. Yeah, usually it's like, as long as it's the, the middle knuckle. Now, I've uh, I've punched um, wrong at one point, and actually this is actually why this is about this knuckle, is because at one point I lost my temper and I punched the wall and I busted this knuckle. So, you know, Damn. yeah, so like my knuckles are like messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm good now. I promise. I promise. So <laughs> hard lesson learned. Punch right here. These these are the knuckles that you punch. And then if, you know, if you're on close, it's like this. Or sometimes I do this from the top. Mm. I'm heading yeah. towards the head. Yeah, like an overhead. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. like this. Mm. Uh, and then I punch like that. And I just throw, you throw your hip in there. The power is actually all in the hips. Yep. Great body. Great torque coming from the floor. Yeah, it's the torque. It's the torque yeah. from the leg to the hip and, to the, and then to the arm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lauren said, she reminds me of my youngest sister who would beat up boys in fist fights. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did, Everybody's scared of you on here now. <laughs> Not these really my promise. <laughs> she doesn't fight, really guys. <laughs> I'm actually really chill. <laughs> you have to be in the good side of Omri. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Oh no, you guys are good. You guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> has a question okay the first the first question of dean is what would you advocate to other women for trying fma so i personally think that in order to advocate for a woman it's you have to be relatable and then i get that that's difficult being a man but it what i usually do when i talk to women is that one, I talk about personal experience uh, Two, you know, the fact that, you know, somebody, it, it's somebody's daughter, somebody's mother, somebody's sister, mm. somebody's, mm -hmm. you have to emphasize that, you know, one, you know, it's to protect yourself Two, It's a chance to protect who you love. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I like to say that, you know, when you put money into life insurance, you're paying for your death. I mean, I get it, you know, but if you want to survive and if you love life, why not invest in something that would protect your life, protect the people that you love? Yeah. Now, women tend to forget, and and I, I get it, you know, complacency. Nowadays, it's it's different. You know, there's police, you know, and this stuff, and all this going on. Um, people tend to get complacent, but it's when 
people that they know that are close to home, that they, they are victims. And I hate saying victims because victims take away the power of the person. People survive violent crimes. Now, mm -hmm. if you look at the statistics, it's man on man, you know, man versus woman, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it tends to be more relatable when it is some somebody close to home. So I would probably yeah. suggest, you know, talking about what's going on in, in, in your community, because I'm sure there's there's crime everywhere. It, it's it's time that you what you need to do is a lot of the time when people get complacent, you have to remind them that complacency is what gets you killed. Yeah, that's so, we have to remind people that they are human. They can die. That you don't know what's going on tomorrow. So, but we know what's going on now. So, in order for us to approach the situation, sometimes you have to kind of bring them back to reality that you know you could be a victim of of a violent crime, and therefore mm -hmm. you need to learn how to protect yourself if you choose to to if you choose your life over another person's life and trying to survive. So that's kind yeah. of what I like. How I approach it is being realistic. I got a I got a quick question for you. Um, so I, I want you. If there's any women? I don't think there's, there's like one woman. I think watching, but uh, maybe later on I can watch it later. So since you've been in these real life situations, what is one thing that you could pass on to women when that key of the moment situation comes up? Is there any advice or any kind of things like mental or anything you could just give tips out there to a woman? Like if she's approached to attack or going to be assaulted. Like what, what goes on in your head since you've been through it, you, you got the experience in it right away. So, is it instincts or? So what I usually like to look at is body language when a person, and, and this is actually how, uh, what happened when I first, uh, when somebody tried to mug me was I'm, I'm very, very situational awareness, um, especially with my kids. I am very, very hypervigilant. Mm -hmm. I, I look mm -hmm. around, I see the, I see the, I see where the fire extinguishers are. The minute that I walk in the door, and that's that's kind of a military a military mindset. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and, and you can relate to that, Brian, right? Yeah. So you know, yeah. I'm very I'm very very aware. Now, the reason why I say body language is because there's there's always a a, a body language that they show that uh, show aggression. Usually mm. for me personally, me personally, when I see a guy like walking way faster towards me than a new than a normal slide. That is when I start pulling out something, pulling out my and, and holding my knife, because I, I do not want to get caught unaware. And what I always do is I always have my back to the wall, because you know, because that way there's nobody that's going to sneak up behind me. Mm -hmm. So you know, I always position myself in a in a situation where I can either maneuver, I, I know where the exits are, um, and I know that there's nobody that's going to sneak up behind me. Now. What I usually do is when a man starts coming up a little faster, that's when I, I face them, I face them and I stare at them. And usually a lot of the time when you know that they're there, they will stop. It's a deterrent because you they, yeah. they, they want easy prey. Yeah. You know, they want somebody that, that you know that they can get right away. So yeah. I don't make myself look like an easy prey. So mm. I always face them and I look at them in the eye and you know I I start I start kind of glaring at them and staring through them like I'm gonna like I'm gonna hurt you and usually they back away. Mm. Um in that situation I had my kids. I had my kids with me, I was pumping gas and this guy was like was kind of like just coming towards me really fast, right? And he, he had a, this black jacket on and he was walking like towards my blind side and I and I always my head is always on a swivel. That's another thing. My head is always on a swivel. I don't have anything in my ear. Um, and that's because, and especially with my kids. So I see this guy and I'm like, I'm already tracking him. And you know, the minute that he comes within five feet of me, that's when I'm, that's when I go into, into yeah. because yeah. you're in my kills. So mm -hmm. when I do that, when I do that, I, I square off with him. And the minute he starts grabbing something, I grab something too. And I stare. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to wait for the first move. So usually when you don't show yourself as an easy prey, a lot of the time they back off because they're going to go look for somebody else. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and that's, that, that's what I like to tell people is, is situational awareness. A lot of it is situational awareness and knowing where your exits are and mm. sure that you are not, you know your environment, you know... Mm can hide in this area or people can hide in that area always being in a well-lit area and unfortunately this was in broad daylight 
So mm-hmm. that's kind of what that's kind of what I preach is don't don't be looking at your phone. You know, it can wait. Get into your car, lock your door, look at your phone. Then you can look at your phone because you at least have something. Or drive just drive away. Especially so, in Vegas. Yeah. Especially in Vegas. In North Vegas. <laughs> I lived in North Vegas for uh, yeah. Yes, yes. And and I've had to and I've had to I've had to do that. And and I, I worked in a very tough area where mm. it was almost every day where somebody's following me. Mm. You know, because it was a lot of meth heads in the, in that area. Yeah. You know, so you know, I had to be very, 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 very aware. Because like I said, mm. I don't want to be a victim. I want to be a survivor. And yeah. you know, I have to have that mindset that to always fight no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually the same. I, I did a, I did a talk on situational awareness for self defense yesterday for uh, the international women's group here in in Stephen H. I did exactly the same. Uh, said exactly the same thing. If you are in, in 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 a place, always know the exit. Basically, know the exit. Basically, know get to know all the like the corners that you can hide or people can hide from. Don't look at don't look at the phone. And when somebody, and also the next thing is proxemics. Know the, basically your safety gap and when people is basically rushing towards you because that's how you would know uh, their, their, their motivation. So, yeah. And of course, uh, what I explained to them is like uh, growing in the, growing the Philippines, you develop that kind of survival mindset in the street. If you grow up here, like for example, here in, 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 in my area in, in the UK, where there's not a lot of mugging that is happening or assault that is happening, not a lot of people would actually think about uh, having to put that mindset or survival mindset on the street. They're oblivious to it. That's why a lot of people can just look at their phone while they walk. So you have to, yeah. you have to pitch it to them to be able to give them the perspective. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's um, my biggest suggestion. Do, do, do you believe that, uh, I know uh, Guru Dean was preaching that before, um, the women's self-defense should be weaponized, or you think empty hand? So, I, so me personally, I like to do empty hand because in the end, you know, you never know what's in your hand. So yeah. I like to think about worst case scenario. What am I having? Now, usually I'll have the Brian special, you know, and <laughs> Brian special, right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, if, if anything, um, I have like some kind of knife. If, if I'm able to carry a knife, I usually carry a knife, um, pepper sprays and stuff like that. But in a situation where sometimes, you know, and, and it depends on where you are. Um, it depends on the laws that you have, you know, in that area that you live in. Mm. Um, personally like to, to think worst case scenario in the end it's not like you can they can confiscate these right <coughs> yeah. no you know what i mean like this is sure they can't handcuff them. <laughs> you know actually you still can fight i'm just saying but yeah. you know i, yeah. I have to test that for you. i know i know but you still can have you still have your hands and you still have your feet now i i cannot emphasize enough you know learning uh, empty hand now, with uh, the thing that I love about FMA is the fact that we have sticks. And the reason why I say we have sticks is because, you know, with with proper with the proper grip, with the proper weight, eventually when you're doing the Sinawali, right, you develop faster hands because you had weight. You have weight. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it you feel low, right? So when, you know, when you're empty handing, you know, when you're doing empty hand hula and all that, um, you tend to be faster. And the reaction time when you're not wanting to get hit by a stick is like much faster. Yes. Mm. Much faster. Yeah. So um, me personally like that. And that is one of the reasons why I love FMA is because you are aware of getting hit with a stick, you know, so you're aware of what is coming in your in your kill zone um, and your hands are faster. And not mm-hmm. to mention that no matter what kind of body weight you have, no matter what, um, no matter what disabilities you have, how old you are, how young you are, it doesn't matter because you can still use it versus all the other different traditional martial arts. If you yeah. have a certain disability, you can't do it. Now, FMA, that, and that's what I love about FMA. It's so versatile um, in, the, in the usage and its practicality. Mm. Yeah, that's why I love yeah. it so much. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And I mean, 
even though we we take time in uh, trying to learn like classical weaponry and everything, you you can transfer it to any kind of uh, weapons of opportunity or something that you see in your environment. You can always use them, and you'll be able to like always adjust to it quickly. Yeah, you can yeah. send them all with your with your phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with your umbrella. <laughs> That's called Reagan, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's called Reagan. And they do that at parties, right? Right, right, you say, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do that. Okay, so they've got another question here. How do you think the FMA community can get more women involved? So I think that um, with with women in general, you know, a lot of it is relativity. Um, a lot of it is if you can somehow relate to women uh, in their situation, you have a, lar a larger chance of of attracting them. Now, you know, women's at defense and uh, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm, I'm a woman myself, but me personally, like I don't really preach women's defense because to me, it's defense is defense. And, you know, me and another grandmaster had talked about this. Um, you know, in that, you know, if with women's defense, you know, we have to take into account, like I said, the community. Well, what is going on in the community? A lot of the time when people are aware of what's going on in the community, that is what will, th that's what makes them realize that it's close to home because mm. it's literally happening a block away, literally happening, happening like, you know, couples doors down, happen in your office building. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of where I, you would use in terms of a standpoint of, of, kind of marketing the FMA. Now, another thing too is one, the health benefits. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you know, women, you know, they, you know they, they, they talk about, you know, weight and whatnot, you know, talking about the health benefits of it, you know, talking about, you know, a way to, you know, to be healthier in terms of their lifestyle, yeah. um, you know, things like that. Um, I would also probably suggest, you know, maybe, uh, maybe going into a community outreach programs. Now, mm -hmm. you know, in inner city programs, um, charter schools, things like that, sometimes, you know, with a little bit of education, a little bit of, and show them what we can do, it tends to be more relatable because they see it um, in the in the public eye. They see it more. The more you the more you the more you show it. The more you throw it out there, and not just and not just social media. And don't get me wrong, I love social media. Um, but sometimes you know, sometimes just being in the community, showing what it is, doing festivals, doing you know, just being out there, being physical, being able to show what we can do, the practicality of it, the, the beauty of it. Um, I think that would probably bring a lot more people, uh, women. Um, and, mm. and, and also what I would probably suggest is, you know, talking to the men. They know somebody. They know their sisters. They know their brothers. They have the mothers. They, they have some woman relative in their family. Yeah. So that's what I would suggest as well, is maybe ha having them teach their family members. They, they'll eventually be teachers if you want them to be teachers. Um, you know, having them reach out to their, their family and loved ones and, you know, emphasize emphasize and be the teacher and be the student at the same time. Yeah. That's a great answer. It's uh, the, more that you, the more that you get them involved, the more that you get them aware. It's actually easier to get them into FMA. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you have to lead by example too. Like if you know, you have to really go out there and show, like in person. Cause like on video, it really doesn't do it justice. But when you actually see it, like you know, in person, and then you start getting more comfortable, like, well, I can do that. You know what I mean? Versus if you see a video, you know, like we all do, like the Karen's videos, and it looks cool when you're doing it, but like it's more the, the effect is more like an actual in person. You know, so I mean, if you do it with another woman, yeah. yeah. If you have a if you have a group of women and, and you're doing Sinawali or you know you're doing Carenza, or you're doing like knife or crumpet, you know what I mean? They get to see that in person and want to gravitate towards it more than when they see it on a video. It's like they scroll through it. Okay, it looks cool, you know. So I think a lot, a lot more, a lot more in person. Yeah. Um, groups of yeah. women would be good. And plus, you can put a better context to what you are doing. Yeah. Just showing yeah, that's. Say yes. guru time with that. We'll do the fancy words. I'm like, I'm just trying to say like, hey, we take our people. <laughs> <laughs> Context. <laughs> it's all about um, context, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so we know what you do at uh, FMA, different martial arts. Uh, 
what's on your plate like for like what's another martial art you'd want to do like besides fma like what do you have what's on your what's on your radar right now like you might want to do i know we talked before about it privately but i want you to say it here you know oh there's a whole bunch okay because yeah. you know like like I said, you know, I love, I love FMA. All everybody, everybody here in the community has been nothing but supportive. I love your videos. Um, I would probably like look into. I was thinking about looking into, you know, sea lot, you know, crop a uh, little bit of crop and capoeira, just because you know it, it because FMA is so versatile and it can be a standalone martial arts. Don't get me wrong. But me personally, I'm as a martial artist, as, a, as an individual martial artist, I like to I like to expand my horizons. Um, and, you know, it, to me, like martial arts is, you know, is like, you know, it's like it's an art. Right. So, you know, you have your canvas, which is me. You know, you have your paints and, and paintbrushes, which is the martial arts. And, you know, you make a, a beautiful design and there you go. That's your martial art. Now, I, I prefer to be a little bit more extravagant with my martial arts and, and you know, in, in, in theory um, and try to learn as much as I can from different styles, because regardless, there's a contribution in every style, not even not and not just FMA outside mm -hmm. of FMA. Right. There is a contribution. Like, for example, my front stance and back stance from my previous martial arts I use in FMA, which is why like, I can transition and change and change levels and whatnot. But, you know, I'd like to expand further just because me as a martial artist, I feel that um, there's a lot out there to learn and I want to grow in terms mm. of my knowledge base. And I'm the, I'm the same way too. Like I've like rank shot at FMA now and went to like, you know, I'm doing Piper, a lot of sea lot I'm doing lately, a lot different systems. And it's just, I'm not just staying just in one you know, FMA. And FMA does have like a lot of, you're, you're right, it's well-rounded. There's like, you know, weapons. Stuff like that, but it's just like I like to learn everything. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people see that, oh, you're a trader, you know. I thought you're a pure FMA guy. I'm like, <laughs> I just want to, you know, if it, if it, if it, like, you know, if it's something that's gonna, you know, protect my life, and you know, it's gonna. Yes. Why not? I'm gonna learn everything. Why not? Yeah. 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 And, 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 and there's nothing with wrong me. with. It. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a matter of investing up your time and how much, how much, in, in the end, it's kind of like the question, how much do you value your life? How much exactly. do you value the loved one that you have? And that, yeah. and, and yeah, you gotta use everything. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be in a situation like, oh, I think I'm just gonna use FMA this time, guys. I'm getting raped. Or, <laughs> I'm getting beaten. You know, like, fuck up. I'm gonna use every fucking thing out there I can, like, to, you know, yeah. get my ass get yeah. beaten. You if know, you if it's like, if it's a whatever. If you have to throw the kitchen sink, you know, just just stop. Yeah. I'll throw this fucking water bottle. I don't give a fuck. Here, you know, just, just as long as you survive, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's not about, about it. It's not about style. But there's some people that are purists that are like, you don't need everything else. You just need this here, and that's gonna. This is a cure all for everything for every situation. Yeah. You know, the, the purists. You know, what I mean, it's like, no, I'm gonna do everything. I don't give a shit. No. I start. I start on Muay Thai. There's still a lot of shit I've used in, like elbows and clinches stuff. That I'll use on the street if I have to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's it doesn't I'm not gonna use only FMA, you know, passing and you know, and that's it, come on. Yeah. When when it comes to combatives or self-defense, when somebody tries to oversimplify things, I go the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't else. I, I respect a lot of people's opinions, you know. It it you know, there there's a value to it, you know, and I you know I take it as a great assumption. <laughs> People have their own opinions, you know, everybody has opinions, you know, it is, what it is, you know, and I, and I respect everybody's opinions. Everybody's style is great. I mean, I, I, I personally love it. In fact, like some of the time, like I'm like, when I'm the one that's like approving the post, I was like, oh dude, you know, like I saw freaking, you know, somebody's, uh, somebody's post, you know, I'm going to wait a few minutes, you know, write my notes down and then approve. Cause I kind of want to have like that little five second, like advantage of like looking at their post and like looking at their video first before like approving it so you know it was like things like that you know i like I, I love everybody's contribution and you know to me you know i and i i get it you know i i, I get the whole purist situation you know so the the thing i, I take away from is this is that you know fma is equal to the sum of its parts like that's a kind of a math situation where you know fma had fma all the different styles they all have a big contribution to fma so you know when people ask me what my lineage is what who where do where am i claiming who am i claiming right i claim fma i claim fma i cannot claim one because i am a 
from a, a lot of different martial arts. And I cannot I cannot hold to the candle of what just one martial That's art. Right. I have to respect all of them. Yeah. So when I say who is who's your lineage? Who's your teacher? Who's this? Who's that? Who's that? FMA, you're my teachers. Everybody's my teacher. You know, for example, you know, Brian, you're my teacher. Tom, you're my teacher. You know, everybody that posts on there is my teacher because I always have something to take away from it. Um, so with that being said, you know, I, 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 you know, I can't say what my lineage is. I can't say, I can't claim anything because everybody, everybody contributes to the style. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way too. Um, I have a main system I study, but like before that I stay with different people and I still take a lot of their stuff. I mean, I think it's like with every system you take the stuff you could use. And the stuff you can't use, and, and that's what I do. Every system I've been in, I just take all the relevant stuff and I put it all in one. No, I I'm, toolbox I'm, really means. I'm, I'm Cobra Kai with Dean Franco. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you you miss you miss you miss that Cobra Kai thing, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> with, right. with, yeah, with, with Dean Franco. <laughs> yeah, I got to see a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I, gotta, I gotta see that. I gotta see it. I gotta see it. <laughs> Mr. It, it Mr. Should, it, it should still be the moderator's chat group, but yeah. Uh, okay, Kara has a comment here. It's also the balance of being mom and martial artist. Everyone else becomes priority over yourself until you decide you need time for you. I am usually the only uh, woman in our karate school. Uh, karate school black belt class. Need more women in all martial arts. So yeah, I mean, Audrey, you're also a mom, right? So oh yeah, yeah. I'm a you mom. You can relate to this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mexican uh, karate. Mexican karate. <laughs> I know about as judo. I, I know judo. What is judo? No. <laughs> I know Mexican judo. Well, judo. I, I don't mind. I'm, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. I'm open to to training outside styles because, like I said, you know. Yeah. It, it, you, you could take bits and pieces of it um, and just, you know, based on based on how you feel, so certain techniques don't work for me. Uh, okay. Certain techniques don't work for one person. Um, to me, it, it's not about right or wrong technique. It's whether the technique works. Now, yeah, and I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about being a woman um, in the martial arts is that, you know, a lot of the time, you know, like I said, it's a male dominated, a male dominated um, uh, experience um, where, you know, a man will teach a woman, but they don't really take into account the body structure, the anatomical structures. Now, I wish I could say that I got, I took credit for this, but I actually got this conversation from Grandmaster Tanya Subing Subing Monroe when I actually came to visit her. Um, and I, I love her to death because she is such a great inspiration, a great resource uh, as a woman, you know, knowing, learning from the Grandmaster. Um, and she was telling me that the reason why, you know, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of a hiccup between women and men in terms of the martial arts is that we, do, we forget to take into account body structures, anatomical features. Now, women, you know, when men teach, right, men teach because, and, and the body structure is that the point of gravity is, the center of gravity is upper body. A woman's body is, and the center of gra gravity is the hips. Now, we also have to take into account, you know, chest. Now, when you're showing things like, you know, redondo, with teeks, things like that, um, sometimes, you know, men will keep correcting, keep correcting, keep correcting, but the woman can't get it. And the reason why is because the structures there, the structures there that men don't really understand. So the the my my takeaway for male instructors is this: is you have to kind of let the woman figure out the technique because they have to adapt based on their body structures. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. I usually, I usually give somebody like I teach women. My, my only students are women. I think I have like one guy. Uh, but I teach them to adapt it, like you said. Like, yeah. it's not going to work. Like, okay, this is going to work. Well, then you can adapt it to the way your body structure works, your movements, because you're, you're mm. smaller, you know, than I am. So it's not going to work. I'm sorry for sorry for hijacking you. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> <Sorry. yeah. laughs> yes, and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought in, I'm glad you see that. Because, you know, like, for example, a hip throw. A hip throw is like, oh, you know, you have to put it up here. And I'm like, well, my hips are down here. Yeah, I'm yeah, fine. Yeah. You know, I'm five one. I have a bit of a back issue, um, and you're five seven, five eight, and I have to take into account the size, the structure, mm. the different the difference, the differences in body structure. Yeah. So, I, another way to make 
uh, martial arts relatable uh, to women is to kind of like give the woman a little bit of space because sometimes, you know, and I get it, you know, I get it, you know, males, sometimes they kind of like over, oversee and it, it, it comes off as creepy. It, it is what it is, right? I guess, um, I'll just show you something. <laughs> I'm going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Maybe if that's not the intention, but um, sometimes, you know, you kind of have to back up a little bit, you know, back up a little bit, let the woman adapt, let her process mm -hmm. because it's a little bit to process. It's and different. then, and then do you come and, and then, step yeah. in general? Correct. And <laughs> if the technique, if the technique is, comfortable to them it's the right technique at the end of the day at the end of the day if the technique saved your life it's the right technique it's the right technique for you right mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong technique there's ineffective and effective technique that's all there is and, to it and, and i think it's good too because like you get, you get the feedback too mm. like because like i'll show something and they'll be like well you know it's not they get that feedback most instructors like no you got to do it it does work you just got to keep practicing it if they get that feedback like no it's not going to work for me because look i'm going to show you and that's what I do, like with me. Like I'm gonna show you. Look at I can't reach because my arms not long enough. And you show me, I can like this. So I was like, okay. Then you just adapt it, like you said. And they come up. They're creative enough where they adapt and they create their own stuff. Like this is the way it works. Okay, that works cool. And use it. You know, I'm, I'm not like a. You know, I'm not gonna be like that's my way. And then you get out because you know I. That's the way I was shown. Now I'm showing you this way. But you're right. You're right, Aubrey. Uh, it's just it's you gotta adapt. Yeah, well, it's it's not just women. I mean, yeah, women, male to uh, male versus yeah. uh, female, but also like you need to understand uh, how your body adjusts to certain situation. I mean, even like amongst male, you've got like male who are ectomorph, who are mesomorph, who are endomorph. You need to adjust. Mm -hmm. Same thing as with with height. You need to adjust to a particular throw. Some throws will work for you. Some throws won't. If you try to if you try to force yourself into one throw, you're gonna you're gonna end up on the at the bottom of the pile, <laughs> and the person is just basically <laughs> smirking on top of you. You try to do it, man. So yeah, it's it's really important that as a teacher you you allow your student to explore and to play around with a particular technique, so at least they can they can get comfortable with it. So yeah, and yeah. I. I, I and I got to circle back on that um, on that uh, question about what's the best way to learn to do the technique um, in terms of in that situation where, you know, it's fight or flight. You know, we have to take into account that when we are in a fight or flight situation um, and this is coming from me as a combat medic. When I was a combat medic, um, when I you know, when there's there's grenades going around all over the place you know there's rifle fire and this is all training, but it, it but it's always good to try to. Uh, trained in, in somewhat of a real life situation where the adrenaline is rushing and you have this guy with a with an amputation and you have to IV the person after you ran three miles. Now, at that point in time, when you are in a fight or flight situation, your, your di eyes dilate and yeah. your fine motor skills are gone. Your fine motor skills are gone. It's all yeah. gross motor skills. Yeah. So my, my suggestion is that in order for you to simulate that situation, in order for you to feel that situation and be able to practice that technique in a real life situation without being in danger, what I would suggest is, you know, putting yourself in that stressful situation, doing push-ups, running a little bit, and then do the technique. If mm -hmm. you can do it with, with just your exhaustion and it's just muscle memory, you got the technique in a real mm -hmm. life situation. Yeah. Now, if you don't, then that means you just got to keep practicing until it becomes muscle memory, repetition. Mm. repetition. Yeah, yeah. You need you need to be able to get your techniques to work, even though your your heartbeat is basically racing fast and adrenaline yes. is pumping and, and everything is hear. narrowing down. Yeah. Yes, and that's all you hear because yeah. you're in that situation. Yeah. You yeah. Have like the, the blindness. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Bram Frank uh, has a comment here. Perspective is everything, how it's perceived, how it's processed, very true, and how one is able to, to then teach it or use it. I'm glad all of you touch on this and making it your own. Be safe. Thank you very much, GM. It's a nice comment. Yep. Okay. You definitely got to have, the pre you got to have pressure testing. That's uh, another thing, too, like a lot of people don't do. Uh, especially with women, like 
uh, if you're a male instructor and try to, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, but I do that. I just go like, usually after like the first, second month, I'll go all out. Like I'm really trying to kill them mm. and see how they handle it and see mm. how they handle it. And I, one time I had, I had a girl <laughs> cry and I felt kind of bad. And I was like, uh, I kind of should have done that. But I mean, yeah, just like, she was like, she was, she was crying like the mad cry that wasn't like the scared mm. like the hitting like, Ooh, yeah. Crying, like, it's it's actually good that you you I brought that up, Ryan, because normally when you practice a skill and you basically pressure test a skill without the element of the emotion and the psychological element, you'll be able to get through it. But the moment you you basically feel that that being scared, that emotion, mm -hmm. then you you'll be able to tip between okay, am I I'm, especially you got fight and flight and you got you got freeze as well you get that momentary freeze so once you get into the situation you manage to you, you get to manage to understand how your body reacts to reacts to the situation emotionally as well so um, it's really good that, that, that is included in pressure testing it is but it, like you feel bad afterwards especially if you yeah of course you're flinging them and they're flying across your cartwheel <laughs> but then they're you know, they're, they're, get get somebody to do it for you. <laughs> well, no, I just do beer, it. Yeah. Beer and karaoke, man. Beer and karaoke. It, it, <laughs> that's, that's, it, it solves everything. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then you got their husbands like, how oh, come my wife is like, they threw her around and she has like a bruiser. <laughs> like, like, well, I mean, like, I just tell them, like, this is the way I do it here. Like, if you want somebody gets to show her, like, okay, put your hand here and go back and then go here. <laughs> I mean, that's not going to do any good, you know, on a real situation. And, uh, you know, New, Me New, Me New Mexico is a tough state. There's a lot of crime here. And there's, there's knife attacks. Our knife attacks ratio here is we have about 20 to 30 knife attacks a week here. Really? Second wow. Albu second Albuquerque, yeah. There's oh, always wow. holdups, muggings. There's some dude, I don't know, I told you a while back, he chopped some dude's head off, was playing like a, with a machete, he was playing the guy's head like a soccer ball at the park over here. Oh, so it's like, Yeah, so I mean, New Mexico is a crazy place. Look, I live in a good area here, but like when you start going to town, there's a lot of edge weapon attacks here. And uh, like, you can't be complacent in your training, mm -hmm. especially in this area, you know. You know, it's just, but yeah. Um, I got a question, uh, Glenn Gutierrez has a question. Um, what grab defense should women learn first? Bear hugs, wrists, long hair, or neck? So what I've experienced um, in terms of grabs um, in my situation was a lot of it was wrist. Um, and usually the reason why is because the wrist is like usually the fastest thing to get. Now, depending on how close they are. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So usually your wrist, because it's farther away from your center line, um, usually it, that is what they grab. Usually it's mm -hmm. the easiest. Now, if a person, if a woman, hair, now if they're attacking from the back, usually it's the hair um, because, you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah, um, so, yeah. So I, you know, this is actually the first time I've actually had long hair in a really long time. I usually cut it and for the sake of fighting. Um, but usually Damn. what I yeah. <laughs> I, I just, no body I just, jewelry. It's actually the first time I've had long hair in a really long time. But, you know, what I've noticed is usually it's, you know, I, and I like to think again in the military, um, it's always a point of, le of least resistance. So yeah, usually it's true. things that are easy to reach, your arms, you know, your bag, your, pur your purse, you know, or your hair. So what I would suggest as first is, is probably start with the wrist, the, the wrist grip, um, mm. the wrist hands first, um, and then go and then, you know, the hair thing might be second what was what i would suggest yeah yeah and usually if you practice if you practice um situational awareness you won't get into the neck and the bear hugs because they're not that close to you so to me that's not as big of a priority as the wrist or the long hair because those are the easiest to grab yeah and plus normally like when they grab you in the wrist they tend they're basically their their mindset is just to reprimand you from doing something or Trying to get away from them. Pull you, try to pull you. Pull you, yeah. Pull you somewhere, yeah. 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 And what I would also suggest, um, usually, and and this is the, this is the sad thing about being in Vegas is Vegas is very high in sex trafficking, and yeah. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Very here, high. Here too, here too. Because I live next to the border of Mexico. I live Juarez, like thirty-two minutes from there. Yeah. So, 
So what I would suggest, um, and this is a suggestion based on where I'm from, is always what I would suggest is practicing one against two. Because mm. the worst you can, the worst that can happen is, you know, the, in, in any situ, in any regular situation, it'd be one against one. But what if there's two people? Mm. So what I would suggest is training, start training two against one. Yeah. And that way you're at least somewhat prepared or at least have the mindset of if there are two people going against you, you already have the mindset, your muscle memory kicks in and mm. you can you know, go back to your training mm. is what I suggest. Yeah. And plus mugging outside. Yeah. You, so you always have a minimum of two people. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think, uh, I think too, with the, uh, with the two people, do you believe that's right off the bat or do you believe gradually training up to that point? So you first deal with your first opponent and then, and then you add that second person in to start training with the multiple attackers or is that you just, do you believe just increments or do you believe just going right training for the two people right away? So I would suggest trying training with the one person for now, mm -hmm. um, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in and there's a lot of, it's, it's overwhelming in terms of stimuli. So, um, you know, when, it, when you're overwhelmed with stimuli, you don't track, you don't process as quickly in terms of training. Now, what I would suggest is, um, you know, start with one, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Mm -hmm. So learn the technique, practice the technique, pressure test the technique. And then after that, incorporate the second, you know, and then, you know, slow, and you know work up to being fast and eventually and this is kind of like what i've seen in krav maga too is they always end up you know they, they apply the pressure as and you know that way the adrenaline rush kicks in and it becomes instinct so that's my suggestion in terms of you know women's self-defense and i personally like i said i don't i'm not a, nothing against women but a lot of the crimes that happen on women a majority of it is men so I would suggest instead of practicing with other women, practicing with men twice your size, because a lot of the time it will be men twice your size that is going to attack you. Yep, that's like I told you. That's exactly what I said. I still feel yeah. bad though. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm paying you to get. I'm paying you to get thrown around and bruised. So like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And, and and here's the thing, and, and this is this is also a complaint too. It's better you get bruised than get killed. Yeah, you know what I mean, true. I'd rather what, be, what? you know, than than you know get killed. Get, never see my kids again being you know sex traffic. You know, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the state. You know, I'd rather I'd rather have bruises because at yeah, least exactly. I'd one of the uh, one of the women I do one of the women I do teach. She actually was raped uh, about two years ago. Um, so now she trains because she doesn't want to be a victim again. And it was somebody that uh, that she knew from work that waited to she went to go throw the trash out, hide behind mm -hmm. the dumpster, and raped her for thirty minutes. Raped her on the ground. To, she had to go next door to the convenience store and call the cops. So she she actually has I don't want to say the experience, but I mean she has the situation actually happened to her. And 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 I don't want to say I, I don't want to exploit that in any way. Like I want to like help her so she never gets like it again. But I asked for insight because she actually went through it. Like you know what will this work? Will that work? Do you think this might have worked when you? And she gives me good feedback. Like no, I don't think that would have worked this time because he had me like this. You know, it's it, it's very emotional for her. And I don't really like doing it. But she like she said she doesn't want other women to become victims. So she wants to kind of share her experience as painful as it is to help other women so they don't have to go through what she went through. Hmm. So yeah, and, and it is it is very unfortunate. And like you know, like yeah. I said, with my yeah. personal experience when I was assaulted, yeah. um, it was somebody I knew. In fact, a lot of the crimes in, in, with women tend to be somebody know. Yes, yeah. And usually, the reason why is because when women know these men, they become complacent and they, they yeah. become a victim. Now, hmm. like I said, I don't. I don't like the word victim, but you know, with that being said, you know, with my personal experience, that's kind of why I have the mindset that I have is because like I said, I've, I've been through it and when I've been through it, I don't want, and unlike her, I don't want anyone else to. Yeah. Have, yeah, exactly. Of course. Yeah. Which is why like, I like to emphasize that, you know, and, and like I said, I have nothing against women's self-defense, but when you're not defending against women, a lot of the time you're defending against men and more than likely it might be somebody, you know, now you know you don't and you don't know that 
you have no idea of, you know what what the situation is going to happen in terms of uh, the day you know tomorrow the day after you know you know you never know what's going on in somebody's head so mm-hmm. you know a lot of it is you know like I said you know situational awareness being able to read body language you know if yeah. somebody is and I have a feeling too with with that person that I'm sorry that that happened to her and I f- I feel for her um, I have a feeling that that person had already hinted at it. Now there's certain verbiage that you have to pick up, like as a trigger. Um, yeah. I asked her that, and she said that this guy that raped that guy that raped her, he only been at work for a week. So basically, he is he was he was convicted for robbery. But I don't know how he got a job there, but he just saw her one day, and he well he saw she went through a trash every day for that week, and he's like, well, there's nobody here, you know, she's working by herself with one other girl in the back, so he took advantage of the situation. I went out of opportunity, and and he raped her. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, so. And this is the red flag. This is the red flag right there is why has, you know, he's been watching her for a week. You know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a red flag for me is why are you here at work when you're not supposed to be working? You know, I'm very, I, I have a, a, what you call a dirty mind. I, I tend to think the worst of people. Oh, we do. <laughs> I, 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 I know it came, it came off weird, but I mean, I, it, you know, it's, I am I'm very cynical. I'm very cynical of people's reasons as to why people approach me. And then like, that's also of course you have to be. You have it, to be. I would love to, to think the, the positive in people, but you know, there's there's some yeah. people out there, you know, they they take you have to go the line. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, that, that once again, that those those kind of red flags, um, and unfortunately, you know, they women don't really think that. But I think that some of the things that, you know, one of the initial things that we need to bring up in terms of teaching women is those red flags, mm. being able to let them know that, you know, yeah. things are not aware, are, are not normal. You know, like yeah. that guy wear on right. his day off for a week. That's, that's, why are you yeah. here? You know, mm. you're not getting paid. Why are you here watching me? Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, well, see, he did, he did that during work time. This guy was on the clock when he did this. Uh, uh. And you know, like it, sometimes you just really, you just really don't know. And, and and maybe you know because of what had happened. Sometimes you know with the trauma, with with trauma, with mental trauma. Sometimes you block out a lot, a lot, a lot of yeah. the situation. You know what I mean? There's certain d- details in 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 what people do um, that sometimes because of the trauma, it tends to overshadow that. Um, you know, I would suggest therapy to be able to get through that. Um, and once you know, once the healing process begins, you know, you start to see the bigger picture of why you know there were red flags there because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm oh, there's 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 it sometimes you know sometimes there is a crime of passion but at the same time um people are predictable with based on their body language you you say stuff but the way you say things the way you move the way you the way your body moves it it brings it people does, up. yeah flag. It does so something. yeah so that's kind of like you know kind of what i'm thinking and i don't want i wouldn't want to pry her because she's been through a lot but yeah. what I would suggest is, you know, open communication with your students is another thing. Being, like I said, being relatable, being able to get down, you know, yeah, you're an instructor, but sometimes you kind of have to drop the instructor thing first and be a person and be a friend first. And that way you can be eventually, when you teach this person, it'll be more more palatable, more um, more relatable to the person. You end up having a conversation and communication yeah. with the person. So that's kind of my take on, on women's self-defense and how, you know, it could be, you, you know, you could essentially bring more women in um, is relatability and being able to, um, you know, eventually, you know, try to be as much as possible being approachable without being creepy. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I get a little bit creepy. <laughs> I think if if you're if you're basically a a female instructor and running a self defense a self defense class for women, you need to while well, ask men to be the attackers or to be the feeders of particular drills. So at least your 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 students will be able to get the benefit of trying out or practicing those techniques against men as well. So while you oversee it, you've got somebody, you ha- you've got your hired goons. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dudes, my guys, right? My, my big dudes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> I think, Brian, you need, to, you need to hire some goons in your class. <laughs> I, am, I am the fucking goon. 
<laughs> but yeah, but you're, you're instructing, so you got to pay them extra and make sure they wear a cup. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah. Fair. yeah. Hey, you know what's funny? We're talking about we're talking about cups. I always wear that uh my groin guard. It's like a big diaper, and everybody's always like a lot of people are making fun of me. What are you doing that for, man? What are you doing that for? I'm like, why not, dude? Like, I don't get kid in the balls. Like, you know, it's like I want to protect as much protection as I can because when I have them struck, I have them kick as hard as I can. Yeah, you know, I'm not just gonna have. A, I'm not gonna get fucking love taps to the nuts here. Yeah. It's like, yo, hey, it's gonna be like, bam, you know what I mean? Or just yeah, good yeah. kick. Yeah, kick it like oh. you mean it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got it. Bro. <laughs> we got the helmets and everything mm. um, with the shields and everything on. So yeah, like, you uh, need to have your uh, personal protection when you're teaching self defense, yeah. especially. Yeah. yeah. But there's some people that, you know, they're like, oh, you don't need all that. Just go slow. And it's like, no. no. I'm going to teach them, like, falls out, dude. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, throw he he climbed me fast. Yeah, he climbed me fast. No mercy. And the other thing, too. Uh, and I was talking to uh, uh, Grandmaster Tanya uh, Monroe, and I said, and, you know, she's always told me, you know, it's either the men go really soft, and I get it, you know, women, you know, get it. Uh, either they go really soft or really hard, you know, there's, it's, sometimes it's not even the middle. And then you have the men that, you know, the men students that, you know, try to overpower the woman instructor because they're kind of showing off. Now, you know, that being said, you know, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, it, you know, it's kind of a matter of a, a balance, you know, you don't want to, you yeah. don't want to enjoy the person. The same time, mm. but at the same time, you can't be too gentle because if you keep yeah. if, you, if you're gentle, if you're gentle, you're doing them a disservice. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah I, 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 my first instructor was Tuan Ruby, and she's 80 years old now. And uh, when I, we first started self defense stuff with her, she's like, "Come on, hit me before I kick you in the twonger." The twonger, <laughs> and it's like, like your dick, right? I kick you. And she's like, "I don't care if I'm 80 years old." She's like, "Hit me," and I'm like, "This lady's like seven. Well, she's 70 something years old at the time." I'm like. I don't really want to punch her like a full blast. But I mean, she had like bruises all over her arms and everything. And she like, she's like, come on. And like, she's like, she would kick you hard, hit you hard. And you have to hit her like really hard back. And then, but she took it. I mean, she took all the blows and for being as old as she was, it was like, and you got, you were kind of, you were scared of her too, because you know, she like, her, her favorite move is what to the balls, right? For most women, it's like, you know, that's so, not like, Movie. Yeah, yeah. Rip, rip your twonger off. Rip your twonger off. I'm like, okay. You know, it's like you better be wearing a cup. But I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm like dropping to my knees and shit. I'm like, I'm gonna pass out. I'm like, and I was like, and I, she wants to get you mad, angry, so you want to, you can hit her. But I'm glad she did that though, because she wasn't afraid to get in there and mix with grown men. Yeah. Proper her age and her size. So, hats off to her for that. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Badass. <laughs> yeah, she, and she's oh 80 years old. She's still teaching. And I'm like, are you going to retire? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep until I die. And I'm like, okay. So, right on. That's ride or die. Yeah. That's a ride or die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. When you were training, so, Audrey, what are the things that you managed to bring? Uh, maybe from your martial arts training to when you became, uh, when you served in the army and vice versa? So what I, what I brought uh, to the army was the fact that when we were, when we were trading um, hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, there was kind of a disconnect with um, the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now in the nine weeks that I did basic training, it was a lot of rifling um, and very bare minimum hand-to-hand -hand combat. So what I did was um, when um, we were done training, you know, I would go, I would, I would roll with the women, you know, and what we do, we would mm. punch the sappy plates, the, um, the Kevlar, the Kevlar. Um, yeah. 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 I hate those things. I yeah. Those. Try punching them bare, bare knuckles, man. <laughs> no, I hit someone with a Kevlar helmet one time and hit the head. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I usually, you know, we would, we would, we would go at it, you know, I, I, you know, start showing them a, like a little bit of the, a little bit of the body mechanics in terms of throwing. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what I brought in terms of the martial arts um, into the army um, was, was that. Um, so I, uh, and, and the funny thing is, is right after that tournament, I actually got combative uh, army level one certified, army level one combative certified. And how I got army level one uh, certified was I was put in a ring with, the 56 original people uh and i had to um this I, I had to neutralize this one guy without hitting him uh with haymakers 
Now, I got thrown in the mix with this one guy who knocked out two service members. So here I am, I'm like, I'm five one, and he's like, five ten, five eleven, and I'm like, oh God, you know, he's gonna hit me, right? So, you know, they're like cheering you on, you're in the circle, you're in the middle, it's freaking fight club all over again. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, this is like high school all over again. <laughs> so, and I had no choice but to neutralize his arms and I couldn't swing, I couldn't kick nothing. So, you know, the guy like at one point I, I did a, I, I, uh, I ducked over when he did a haymaker and, you know, just as I got up, he hit me again. I don't remember anything after that, but I think I got him because supposedly everybody cheered up and then like they took me out. But, um, <laughs> you know, that makes sense. I was level one certified. So that's, that's what I got from the army was the fact that, you know, I, learning to do things in the moment where your gross motor skills are all that is what is keeping you alive. Um, being able to, to think, you know, think things through. And when you're in, in that moment, the hypervigilance, the situational awareness, that's what I got from the army. Um, along with, you know, being a combat medic, um, learning how to save a life, you know, the vital points of yeah. you know, somebody alive in terms of shrapnel, I, you know, an IED, um, mm -hmm. gunshot wound, not um, using that as knowledge for healing people, and the, and then bringing it to the military, to the F FMA world, where I can use those skills in in, in the terms of knife, uh, knife, stick, and whatnot to try to you know kind of use it against people at the same time, being deadlier, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you know, there was a lot of things that I learned from the army um, in terms of my training as a combat medic, but at the same time, you know, I'm hoping that eventually, like in that time that I was there, that I was able to instill something with the people that I worked with. Mm. For the benefit of those who are watching that uh, doesn't have any, well, who, who, who doesn't know anything about like the army combatives, um, how, do, how do you describe the program? I mean, what is what are the things or skills that are involved in the army combatives program? So the Army Combatant Program is essentially BJJ. Um, it's um, it's basically you know it's it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, level one consisted of being on the ground, you know, the mug or like BJJ. Um, the level twos, threes, and fours were going into the stand up the stand up fighting. Um, the, my my training was a little different in that um, I also learned rifle manual where I had to use a, a rifle to be able to subdue them, and it's called pugils. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't as heavily trained, but because I had a Serata background, I had a little bit of an advantage. Um, so when I did competitions for Pugles, I had a little bit of an advantage. Um, so, you know, the, the training was mostly, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, you know, the neutralizing of the enemy, being able to analyze, analyze the body, the, the body, um, protecting your midline and being able to, you know, do that, do, do that and use it effectively in, in this combat situation. Okay. Uh, Richard has a question here. Army combatives during uh, basic training, or do you do that after basic? This is the so, after, is it? So, in in when I had um, when I had army combatives, um, and they introduced that, that to me actually during um, IT. Uh, which is job training in, in, in the civilian terms. Um, but I did a little bit in um, they 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 put a little bit of it, they introduced it in basic training in terms of like a one to two day situation because it's, it's nine weeks. So, yeah. you know, a lot of it is being, is, is, you know, yelling at you, screaming at you, learning how to make your bed, making sure it's just right dress, you know, like in order to break you down and be able to be more situational aware, being able to have attention to details sharper than mm -hmm. a, any civilian. Now, when um, when I was doing army combatives, um, I was actually doing it in basic training um, just because there was a lot of downtime. Um, it was a lot of hurry up and wait. So you're there like at, at five o'clock, but the, the time you're supposed to be there, you're actually supposed to be at seven. So it's like 15 minutes to the 15 minutes to the 15 minutes to the 15 minutes. So it, essentially, I was there like three hours early to my destination and it's, I wasn't even supposed to be there. So the drill sergeants that I trained with, one of them was combative certified level four. Um, so he, you know, he used that as the time, you know, during the downtime to be able to kind of introduce, you know, hand to hand combat um, and a little bit of the rolling. Um, so mm -hmm. instead, of, and I got, I, I actually had a little bit of an advantage over other um, other basic training groups. It was because we had a lot of downtime, and our sergeant was. Um, uh, Army combatant certified level four. So he, you know, during the downtime, he threw in the training, 
so I had a little bit of an introduction before I actually got thrown into the tournament in, in Sports Sam Houston. <laughs> All right. Okay. That, um, uh, go. Coach Let Danny. Me. Coach Danny has Coach Danny has a comment. I want to say hi to him too. Great guy. Great guy, by the way. Um, it says when I do women's self defense, I always have one of my female instructors lead and have my male instructors support by being the pad holders and be the bad guys because they know how to work with participants. Yep. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree. You know, and that's that's to me that's like the most realistic way of um, but prior to yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So Richard wants to know how much FMA is in the Army combatives. Um, when I went through, not much. Um, I, in fact, it was more it was more MMA than FMA. Um, mm -hmm. Most that I got in terms of even like a suggestion of FMA, and maybe it might be different in the other levels. Um, but the in terms of um, the combatives, the the FMA combatives is the. The only time that I've actually ever seen it was during the rifle training when you had to fight with your rifle when it's empty. And that was the Pugles. And Pugles were this, like, you know, if you guys saw, like, American gladiators, like, you know, the, the big Q-tips. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Blaze and what other dude's fucking name in there? Saturn or some shit? Or I don't know. Something. Yeah. So I'm rambling on. Uh, I think the F, I think FMA taught more what the, the spec ops like for the knife and stuff like that. Start yeah. getting more into it. Yeah, yeah so I know. I know. Guys, a ranger here is a sharpshooter, and he told me he took some of the, the FMA stuff like with the uh, knife. Yeah, I think yeah. some yeah. some uh, branches, either both uh, army and navy, also did that as well. So they had some because I think uh, like with the seals, uh, Francucci or something. Did some FMA with them. Frank Cucci, I think that's the name of the guy. And he's uh, he's from the Inosanto group as well. Oh, wow. yeah. 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 I personally when I was uh, when I was going in because I'm an I'm a I'm an E4 enlisted, um, I had to kind of search for my own martial arts outside of uh, outside of the army. Um, because that like I said it was something that like was very important to me. So so, so, so would you say somebody took the combatus class is more than capable of hanging himself in a real life street situation. Like when they get out of the army, are they, unless they, what well, they have to keep practicing obviously, but are they pretty efficient in a real life situation? Like if they would take that army combatant training onto the street, do you think they'd be able to hold their own or no? Yeah, n not really, not really. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest, not really. Um, okay. Just because when I, when, and it, it, well, it depends on the level that they achieved. Yeah. When I was level one uh, combative certified, I had to start on the ground on my knees. That's not practical. It's not, you know, if I didn't know anything, I'd be screwed. So, you know, like, I like, I, and that's why I'm, I'm glad I, I did the training what I did. Um, was that, you know, if you are level one certified, unfortunately, it's not enough. It's got to be, you got to add on more to it. Hmm. Cool. But, but I think it's more of like the mindset. That that uh, that basically like ultimately prepares you for 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 the outside. So it's the same thing like in martial arts. It's really more of like the mind discipline, the mindset. Sometimes it's not really about the the physical technique, but the emotional and the psychological side that prepares you for it. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It is. So the goal of the goal of basic training is really essentially to break you down and build mm -hmm. you up. And mm -hmm. uh, and. A lot of it is breaking down a lot of the civilian, the civilian mindset. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the attention to detail. You know, why is this shoe like tilted a certain way? I'm gonna throw your bed and your locker all over the place, and you are gonna like fix everything, right? That was that was basic. You know, walk in your floor, and if there's like a speck of dust, you're in trouble. You're, you're, you're gonna get smoked. So you know, it was a lot of a lot of attention to detail. And being in the old guard when I was, um, like I said, the escort to the president, I had to, you know, my my things had to be measured properly. There's a, it's got to be a lot of measuring and a lot of attention. Your, your gig line has to be straight, their belts. Oh God, yeah. a quarter of an inch, you know, your rack has to be this high. You know, this measurement has about a one inch, your, mm. your yeah, so it, it's a lot of attention to detail. So that's what, like, I kind of my my mindset is a little different because I had to yeah. adapt to the point of very, very, very minute details that I have to pick up. 
And I think that's good because, like, even for me, like, I went to basic, you know, obviously not, it was different based than yours, but the attention to detail helps me out with your training. And even my job now is, you know, yeah. with the it, people's lives on the line, you know, I have to work on an aircraft. Mm. If you don't safe, safety wire bolts are going to go into the, you know, mm. where the pressure lines yeah. are at, a nut can back out, it could kill, crash, crash the aircraft. Yeah. But, you know, you have to have that attention to detail. The t-shirt folding, all that mm. shit had a purpose. Yeah, that's, that's even with training. Yeah, so. and it helps you develop a, a proper situational awareness as well. Yeah, and also trying to link into like your responses and everything. So it, it does basically uh, give you an advantage if you have that kind of training. Yeah, critical analysis thinking. Yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, even me, like when I teach you now, like I gotta make sure, like I'll sit there and I'll watch them, and then I'll be like, no, like. I get anal sometimes, like, oh, yeah, maybe, like, a little bit more over here, and, you know, because I had that attention to detail, you know what I mean? Even though it's a bad habit, not a bad habit, but sometimes <laughs> it can't be a bad habit in training, I guess, because you, you overthink so much. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any more questions, reactions? No, I think that was it. No. That was it. So, yeah. um, so, well, so, so we always like to uh, we end the show by saying, uh, what, "What are your, what's your future goal?" I'm gonna play a good Dean Franco here. Future goals? <laughs> what's going on the line? What's going on the line with you? <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> CEO man. All right. Uh, so, what I was hoping to accomplish, you know, later on down the line, you know, it's you know, right now uh, I'm kind of like floating in the breeze, so to speak. Um, but I would essentially like to, um, you know, I, I hear that there's a September 3 um, Grandmaster, um, Darren Tabone has been throwing um, a lot of uh, info into this uh, Legacy 9. Um, I was hoping to go visit, you know, uh, pay my respects because in the end, you know, a lot of a lot of those martial artists that are current that are going to be in that seminar um, made a very big influence in my life. Uh, made a made a very big influence in my martial arts life. Um, so I, essentially, like I'd like to pay my respects and be there. Um, and you know, as as a student, to be able to you know learn from them and take away things, um, take away uh, information with them. Um, so essentially, like I'd like to you know I'd like to pay my respects and you know hopefully you know hopefully every you know the people watching here, you know, um, and, and the FMA discussions, um, I'm hoping maybe, you know, you guys can come by because I think it's, it's a piece of, it's a piece of history, uh, from these guys. Um, and it's a lot of information to take from a lot of these grandmasters, uh, from all over the States. Um, it's a lot of information on top of that. They're going to throw in the, the healing process, which, you know, not many people know about that, that part of FMA is the healing arts. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a That's very, great. It's very underrated, but it's actually very important. It's a very key element because it, uh, FMA, uh, martial arts in general, is a, is a combination of yin and yang. Um, in order for you to be a much more well-balanced uh, martial artist, it's good to also know how to heal people, how to comfort people mm. on, top of, on top of killing people. You got to know how to heal yeah. people. Mm. So, you know, like I, that's so. <laughs> that's, my, that's my healing arts. <laughs> Right, and then and you know they, they have that there, um. Yeah, so you yeah. know combination, right? So you know I'd like to you know I'd like to you know like probably you know talk about you know Legacy Nine, um, which is going to be here in uh, Las Vegas, um, September three. Um, I highly encourage everybody to come because there's a lot of information out there, and there's like I think fourteen grandmasters on the clock, um, on on the clock giving out this information. I mean, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of information, a piece of history. Um, it is, it is paying respects to Grandmaster Angel Cabales, um, along with all of the, all of the other, um, FMAers out there. Very, very good amount of information there. So I'd like to encourage and maybe hopefully go, um, go and visit and say hi and, you know, pay my respects. Maybe you can go live over there if, if they allow that over there We make it maybe like Dean yeah. with, the, with the camp, like a, the interview like a, or something. Well, just like a short, like short interviews. I don't have to do like a whole show, but maybe just yeah. like a couple segment interviews. I think it'd be great. That would be. Because I think that I think that there's a lot of you know there's a lot of um, a lot of information out there, um, and to be able to be within like five to ten feet of you know of these of these grandmasters, 
you know, it's a great, it's a great um, opportunity um, that doesn't really come very often. So um, that being said, um, you know, and I, and like I said, I have a lot of respect for all of these masters. They've contributed so much. Um, they've contributed and they brought us this art. Um, it's best to, you know, at least, you know, show up, say hi, you know, whatever, you know, learn, learn what you can. Um, so take away with you. You know, I asked uh, uh, Grandmaster Felix Royalist to come on here, so he doesn't want to do any interviews, but that's one person I would like to get on here eventually, sometime, if he ever if he ever changes his mind and agrees to it. Hmm. He has a real successful stick business. He's just a nice, really nice gentleman, and uh, he's uh, has a lot of knowledge and stuff like that, so maybe you see some of the stuff his son's doing with the boxing with Freddie Roach and stuff, and some of the stuff he's doing with his, with his system, and hopefully he changes, maybe he can change his mind when you're there. Maybe you can buy him a beer and be like, hey, uh, Brian said he should change your mind. <laughs> Grandma said Felix is awesome, actually. He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's I, I, re I really, really respect the guy. He's, he's got a lot of information. Omri, have you connected with uh, Virgil Apostol? Not yet, I think. I think. Yeah, he, uh, he is into the healing arts. Somebody okay. I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely, I'm, 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 I'm all like I said. I'm always open. Um, my uh, my former mentor, oh, he's still my mentor up to now. Uh, always used to stay. Always used to say, um, keep your cup half half full only, because you always have something to put in there. So exactly. I'm never, I, I'm never against anything and anything yeah. like that. Any information. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so besides that, oh, is that besides that? What what future goals do you have for yourself, though? Besides. Going to the legacy, what like what else do you have for you? personal goals for yourself? Personal goals for myself. Well, geez. I, know, I feel like I'm giving a damn interview here, but it's like I gotta get to the meeting. I'm not gonna be <laughs> great, the meeting great, right? You know, yeah. eventually, you know, I think eventually I would like to I, I would like to go back into teaching. I, I mean I love I love instilling that knowledge. Um and, and like I said, you know, passion, passion is contagious. Now yeah. um you know, we're only on this earth for so long and as much as possible, I like to like leave a piece of myself behind in case, you know, if ever, you know, I get called somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So, I, you know, eventually what I would like to do is is teach. Um, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm not there yet. But like eventually, like I would like to get I, I would like to get into, you know, teaching uh, in the meantime, like I am very open to mentoring. Um, in fact, there's you know a couple of people that have talked to me about you know Carranza and stuff like that. Um, I'm always I'm very approachable. If you guys haven't noticed, I'm very very approachable with you know, <sighs> people asking questions. Nah, you know I'm a snob. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. And, and, I, and I think that you don't have to be like a ranked black belt or grand master instructor to teach. I mean, I mean, even before I even got like ranked, before I was like I was just teaching people like what I knew. Like I asked permission, of course, from, you know my my instructor, but he's like, yeah, he was you know PM Allen was cool. He's like, yeah, show. Him. If you want to show them, you know, stuff like that, go ahead. You know, I encourage you. And so you don't have to be, I just want to put, you know, people know that already. You don't have to be ranked or, or even like, like you said, at that level, like if you got knowledge, you know how to do something like that good and you're good at it, share it. I mean, I don't believe in like, you have to wait to a certain time where you're able to, you know, I mean, Guru Tom just feels differently. He's, he's kind of sitting there judging me around like, you bastard. It's like, but, <laughs> he's just like, but you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't think you have to be, I think Paul's watching too. You probably agree with that too. Um, you don't have to be like a certain title to like teach, you know what I mean? No, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm, you, you don't, you don't have to have like, yeah, a certain title to be able to teach, but at least you need, you, you be able, you have that kind of understanding that you know what you're to doing. Know it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because like one of the things that I've I've always encountered is like uh, people get into uh, like mimicking or just basically uh, how should I put it? Just basically you have to understand mimicking. what you're showing. Yeah. So yeah. You if you if you get into drills and you don't understand basically what why why mm -hmm. you do these drills and everything, so it's really hard to teach those drills to others. So yeah. and you, you get. And this, and this is one of the one of, one of the things that we we do have problems like in FMA. So you you basically have instructors who are very good at drills, but the context that goes with the drills. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and, and that and that's what I meant. I mean, like you know, to mimic everything. Like okay, I'm showing you this wrist lock. You know what I mean? You have to understand, you know, the mechanics of it, obviously, the context of it, 
And that's what I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to say like, you know, like my son's over here. He's 14 picking his fucking nose over here. He can show me how to do like knife and like a, I wasn't saying that. I was just saying that, you know, you understand the concepts, what you're teaching. Yeah. You have to understand what you're showing instead of mimicking. Yeah. 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 So, but I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to reach like. No, 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 no. In order no. to show it. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, on, and to be honest, I think that, um, you know, I also want to like, pressure test it first personally yeah just because yeah. um you know and i like to maybe eventually like try doing these techniques in tournaments and whatnot because you know sometimes sometimes you know the best way to know that a technique works is to be able to be put in that situation where you have to use it um mm -hmm. so me personally like i would like to you know test out the theory um and be able to use it and that way um and that way, you know, I can essentially, you know, show. And I, and and honestly, like I've been, you know, I've been slowly like showing some people like certain things. Um, I'm more like I like to say I'm more of a mentor than anything um, right now at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to, you know, once I get yeah. to the point. Yes, the, me uh, the mentorship <laughs> comes with the teaching, though. I mean, you got to be a mentor and you know, sort of yeah. it goes hand in hand. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's it's you're doing, you're definitely doing right. Like it's that's. Awesome, but I see if you have it in your heart and like you want to do it, I, I'd say go for it. You know, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> do it, whatever, man. You only live once. Do it. Who cares? What everybody else thinks. You know. Yeah, no, I, I totally know. agree. Totally agree. Got me fired up now. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like. I'm like emboldened now to go like no, another, another time though, another day. Next time, <laughs> next time. Next time, <laughs> next time, yeah, next time. Right, this, this has been great though. I mean, it's been fun. Um, just screw Tom. Anything you want to add or? Um, no, I think we had we had covered quite a lot tonight. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it was Yes, yes, it was. It was awesome. I'm glad you're so real and like you put the stuff with the women's stuff out there. You're not you're not sugarcoating it. And I'm and I want to thank you, like personally. I know Guru Thomas, thank you for sharing those experiences um, because I know it's hard, you know, to talk about those things. And uh, you you got a hundred thousand percent respect. You know, I respect you. Um, I think consider you in a short time. I think you're you're a good person and you're a friend of mine. So like, I want to thank you for sharing those experiences. I know you didn't have to, and. Uh, you know, I hope you don't feel like we kind of pressure you into it, but you know, I'm glad. No, I'm just, glad to, hey, here's the money later. I'll pay you later. And, uh, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yes, it's it's difficult to share, but yeah. at the same time, to me, like the it's it's difficult. But in times of difficulty, that's when you have the test of character, and you know, to, and like I said, relatability. Um, you know, I I like to you know, as much as possible, be as relatable and as um, as genuine as possible. Because if I can't be genuine with myself, how can you take me seriously? Exactly. So, so I'm, I'm very transparent with, with my purpose because, I mean, I have no ill will. Um, so I'd like to, as much as possible, convey that with people I talk to that there's no hidden agenda. This is this is kind of who I am, you know? And yeah. if I can't accept who I am, I mean, how, how, how are you going to be able to accept me? Mm. So that's kind of how, how I think of things. Um, and like I said, I have, I am a survivor. I'm not a victim because if I say I'm a victim, that means I gave that person power. Now, if I'm a survivor because I did it myself, I got myself out of a situation and it's about verbiage. It's about verbiage, which, um, changes your reality, which changes your, changes your truth. So, you know, it's sometimes, you know, the change of the words means a, a big deal in a person's life. And that's exactly. kind of like how I'm kind of, going into so um i want to before we go uh paula was putting some comments i want to read them I think, I think they're good um thanks paula for agreeing with me uh appreciate it um he says if you want to teach teach be honest about your levels of knowledge which you talked about um mimicking's foundation understanding doesn't really come from anything other than doing sparring fighting competition agree with him again um and also like you said everyone's not down it's, not everyone is down to travel uh that path with the sparring and you know the fighting and people everybody has their own journey what they do um and you know just because some guys out there you know beat the shit out of nothing to do with the stick some other game guy might not like it um they may just like knife i mean at the end everybody does their own thing and i think everybody should respect their own you know what they do um i think after my discussion that's a good thing about that you know we're not calling people out because you know some guys not putting stick fighting videos every five 
minutes out there. You know, there might be some guy in his garage or in his backyard that's doing great shit that we haven't even seen yet. Um, and a lot of people love to keep it private. I mean, me, like me, like I don't put a whole lot of shit out there. And like I do once in a while, but like I'm not a person that wants to be out in front of the camera constantly, you know, doing Carenza training. I just don't have time for it. But my schedule, I just don't want to either. Um, it's personal for me. I think I think uh, uh, Aubrey's the same thing. Like for you, like you like to go out there and, and show what you can do, which is great. You know, I don't hold that against you. But everybody has their own thing they like to do. So I think everybody should like respect each other as far as the community, as far as, you know, what they do. Guru Tom's always out. He's always doing the uh, dance videos. He's always doing the yeah. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather I'd rather dance. Yeah, I'd rather dance. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the same with you, Brian. I don't I don't have the time to always like uh, have the have the camera pointed at me doing practicing and everything. It's not how I. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and I know a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people bust balls for it. Like, oh, come in out there to do videos. Oh, oh, come in out to do a knife defense with your kid. You know, like, <laughs> like you hammer fisting the side of his fucking head. I'm like, oh, but I got dude. Like, I don't want to do it. Like, it's like nah. that's cool, you know. Like, yeah. Cool, and what, what what also we need to we need to be reminded of is, I mean, in in any martial art, not just FMA, people have their reasons for taking that journey. Exactly. So, like it, it, I just said right now, okay, so yeah. you're trying to honest with yourself. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, yeah. And we, we as martial artists should be able to respect everybody, okay, regardless of what path they're taking in their, in their martial art journey. Uh, before we go, somebody, uh, Glenn Gutierrez said maybe another interview is in the works, violence and a medical professional. Now, I mentioned that to uh, Guru Dean about that, about maybe doing a, a, interviews with people like you with a, with a nursing experience yeah um about trauma care maybe uh uh first aid and i know everybody's like everybody knows how to tie a tourniquet i mean let's put a you know a band-aid on but i want to really go on a depth like as far as like what to do i think operate be perfect i'm gonna plug her again perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice that is that, that is actually interesting because um there are a lot of things that we have been using, for example, like in, like in uh, FMA, like with the time of death that was uh, proposed by Fairbank, but it has been debunked recently. So it, it means that one of the things that we're banking on as far as like defying the snake is concerned, I think there was already one video that was put out. So it might not really happen outside. So like, it's almost like that one, sh one, one slice and that's going to solve everything. It might not happen outside. So it's, I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think we should, we should definitely do another yeah. meeting and have a, go down that route. Yeah, and with, uh, some when, I, when I did this interview with uh, Doc Adrian, they had, the, the, this is personal experience. Hitting, hitting somebody was holding a, a, a screwdriver using it as uh, using it to stab people hitting the person five times or more on that arm that person was still holding the screwdriver yeah so yeah. those are the realities that we really need to to uh, be able to to understand okay. and, and, and i don't i don't want to make a show where we're giving stuff away so people can watch and be like oh i'm gonna hit this guy right here and i'll kill him just stuff like uh just general like uh you know first aid um yeah going like, pain compliance um like this like perfect suggestion he said violence and medical professional just get your perspective on you know first aid since you're being a combat medic you know about yeah. what we should do and maybe we could, maybe we could do demos you know and have like a dummy or something okay like, you know, you sure. use your kid tie a tie thing on or something or <laughs> turn a kid on your kid's head or some shit or i don't know something we could figure out something but i, I kind of want to that's overlooked and i think in all the episodes we had Okay, we've got the aspect of you know taking somebody out, but how about saving life and preserving life? Like we haven't done a show on that yet. Yeah, so I think we should maybe go yeah. into that territory. Um, call me crazy, you know, call me old fashioned, but no, we are. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, that is an important part of training as well. Learning how to let yeah, we say like manage catastrophic bleeding or stop the bleed. I think that's known in the states as yeah. stop the bleed program. Yeah. And we've even did that. We've even did the psychological, um, mm -hmm. the caveman mythology of thinking and stuff like that. So let's go into the medical. Yeah, uh, I think that's good. Yeah, why not? Something to look forward to. 
Let's make it a theme. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Let's make it a theme. All right. So, All right. Now, on that note, let's get. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. So, okay, so me, myself, and Brian would like to thank Audrey Car Aubrey Car Carbonell for being our guest tonight for episode 265. Thank you. It has been awesome. Awesome. yeah, awesome. I knew it was gonna be good. Awesome. I knew it. And uh, Guru, Guru Aubrey is going to start doing some uh, some interviews. So hopefully, because some women practitioners that are watching, um, she doesn't bite, and I think that she can. Uh, <laughs> I she think that bite, you know, she, <laughs> she punches. She punches. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad that maybe she can. Uh, maybe she can start interviewing some females uh, practitioners on her. I think she'd do great at doing it. So if you're female practitioners are watching, she's available for interviews. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I've been on the spot. There you go. All right. I want to Sorry. All right, guys. Got some chicken enchiladas waiting for me here. I got to put Right. Here, so. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, guys. Good. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. Right. Bye, bye. It's been great. Bye. Bye.